I'm I'm probably not as much of a, uh, an authority, shall we say, on electric vehicles as you are, but I do get a lot of stuff. I do read a lot of stuff. We publish a lot of stuff. And a lot of people are now making the, the claim that the EVs are getting a lot of pushback from consumers and are not doing as well, and that the hybrids are really superseding them. And, and so we exchanged notes on Facebook, and you kind of foo-fooed that whole thing. So what's your opinion on that? Uh, are they right? Yes and no. It's a classic case here. Uh, what we're seeing is the classic sort of misinterpretation and exaggeration of numbers. Uh, oddly enough, it's sort of like when we had, oh, maybe a year ago, when people were overstating the case for EVs taking over and how fast that would happen. Well, we're now seeing the same doom and gloom. It's the classic sort of flip-flop. So let's talk some numbers. Let's go back to 19. Just four years ago, EVs didn't even make up 1% of the retail market, less than 1%. They hit 5% last year, and they're going to close 2023 based on what we know so far, at about 85 to maybe 8.9% of the total market. That's not bad. I mean, it depends on how you want to look at it. Oh, it's only 8.5%. Yeah, but it's up from nothing. Where have you seen any segment of the market grow 850 plus percent in four years? That's significant. However, the market in terms of growth has largely flattened out for the last few months. So it's growing about the rate of the entire auto industry. So no other segment uh, is really doing that much better. Everything is sort of going along like this, as we've seen as the industry recovers. So is that a collapse? Not at all. It just means that growth is not accelerating at multiples of what the industry is doing overall, multiples of what the overall U.S. market is. Now, if you'll allow me to continue for another second, Mike, let's, talk about, let's talk about hybrids. Hybrids have really shown some growth this year, and they're up about or very, very slightly higher as a percentage of the market. So you have people out there going, oh, well, hybrids are it. Well, yeah, but they're also in the eight plus percent market. So it's it's all a matter of how you want to look at it. Uh, oh, it's wonderful. Hybrids are doing over 8%, but it's terrible that EVs are doing just over 8%. Well, not really. They're both growing. The, pro the, the reality is electrified vehicles of all forms continue to grow. Hybrids just are getting a little bit better right now, getting a little more traction. Uh, because there is a ton, there are a ton of new ones coming. If you look at Toyota, for example, when's the last time you saw a new vehicle other than Tacoma that didn't have a new hybrid option? Uh, they have a bunch of vehicles. Uh, they, they've just introduced a bunch that are hybrid only. So a lot of Toyota now, it's hard not to get a, a hybrid. We'll see EVs grow. We'll continue to see them gain traction. And here's the most important number. For the first time ever, EVs will end this year with sales of over 1 million. That's great. Uh, and I know GM in particular, uh, uh, by 2035, I believe, is they said they're not going to produce any more internal combustion engine vehicles, subject right. to change, of course. And, of course, one thing that caught my attention, and I'm cringing, is my favorite car, the Camaro, well, this may be the last year for the particular iteration. There's now, I've been reading all these, you know, stories about, oh, they're going to come out with an electric version. They might. Hey, you, you're about to have a little more than a year from now, a an all electric version of the Dodge muscle cars. So uh, we're, why not? We're going to see Challenger uh, return as an EV. Uh you know, this is not surprising. And the reality is that when you, if you're into the performance side of the market, if you're really into the 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 the, the raw number and the feel of it, EVs are spectacular. Uh, we have a uh, a new version of the uh, uh, Lucid Air coming, the Sapphire. I guess it just went on sale. 
That's 1.9 seconds, zero to 60. All right, to be accurate, 1.86 seconds, zero to 60. Try to do that with a gas model. Yeah, uh, it's an old street racer. That'll jerk your head back, right? So uh... Yeah. Now, there's a flip side. Uh, you don't have a you don't have a manual transmission or even an automatic. Uh, most all electrics out there are single gear, and they don't make much noise. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see what happens because the the Dodge Daytona Challenger uh, SRT. I always get which order those those names come in. Uh, the that new model which will be coming out. Very was very late next year, or early in 25, uh, we'll have a, a transmission. It'll actually be able to at least emulate the feeling of shifts. And they've come up with something they call a fratzonic uh, sound system. It's, uh, it's designed to make you really believe that you're driving a classic V8. I've heard it. I've heard an early iteration. And I have to tell you, it really does fool you. You really think you're driving a, a classic Hellcat. Yeah, uh, I know Harley Davidson was looking at something along these lines years ago. I don't know where that went, but they were looking at an electric bike. But that was the big appeal of the Harley is like when they punch it, everybody for the next two miles around can hear it take off, right? Yeah, exactly. But by, by the way, uh, the uh, you know the numbers are are like I said, looking looking a little bit slower right now. Uh, but the reality is we are going to see more and more models coming out, EV models coming out in the next year. So that's going to be very interesting. Will will the flood of new products start to encourage people to get back into the segment? Also, we should start hearing more news about what's become the biggest concern of the public, not so much range anxiety with more and more vehicles doing 300, even 400 miles on a charge, but charger anxiety. And, and I get that. As an EV owner, I get that. We need to make sure that there are more public chargers and that they work. And that's been one of the problems with a lot of the charging companies. Uh, on the other hand, people need to realize that they may go the better part of a year without ever plugging into a public charger if they have a charger at their home. So some of the information is a bit misleading. The reality is every day, when I go downstairs, if I'm going to get in my my EV, I've got a, an F-150 Lightning, I've got a full charge. I think the number of times I have charged in a public station since I got the vehicle in uh, August of 2022 is, I think I'm up to four, maybe five times. And one of those was because I just simply forgot to plug in at my house and had run it down a bit. So the reality is most people don't need public chargers, and if they do, it's going to be very rarely. Now, what – yeah, I'm sorry. I was just going to say the incomparable Matt Roush has now joined us. And so hey, good to see you. We were talking about EVs and where they're at, and now we're talking about chargers. Did you want to weigh in at all? Uh, not at this point. Let me just catch up here. Ah, well, okay. I'll let Paul talk a little more, then you, then you can catch up. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, one of the other things I want to mention, and this is an interesting story – uh, we have seen a lot of debate within the industry about the pace of EV rollout and whether uh, the strategy that GM and a few other manufacturers are taking by saying that they're going to go 100% to EVs, and in some cases along the way, will only focus on EVs. Uh, Toyota, while they say that they are going to eventually expect to get to all true zero emission vehicles, which will be EVs, and they may include hydrogen. Uh, they have taken the position that along the way, they're going to continue to have hybrids and plug-in hybrids. And it looks very likely that GM may change its short to near-term strategy. We did a story on headlight.news just, uh, what was it, a week and a half ago, in which we had some details on GM's plans to actually add back in some hybrids and plug-in vehicles. You're going to probably see some of their heavier duty vehicles, i.e. a uh, Silverado or maybe one of the big pickups, uh, that may become available with some sort of hybrid drive. And it's interesting to see that the folks over at Stellantis have come up with not only an all-electric version of the Ram 1500, 
but they have the Ram supercharger, which will use a gas engine when necessary as essentially a range extender. The gas engine will not provide direct torque uh, torque to the wheels. It'll never power the wheels. But what it will do is act as a generator if you need it for extra power or when your battery runs low. It'll act as a generator to keep you running until you charge the batteries up again. And then there's hydrogen, which won't be used for, you know, passenger vehicles. But big fleets like semi-fleets are now are looking seriously at hydrogen, I'm being told. Is that correct? Uh, half correct. There's a fairly good there's fairly good support for using hydrogen for uh, heavy duty and longer distance, medium duty trucks for good reason. Uh, the amount of batteries you need would be extraordinarily expensive and also cut into the weight, the freight hauling capacity of full size trucks. So you're now seeing a number of manufacturers, uh, established brands like Hyundai, for example, and Toyota are developing and are already field testing, fleet testing, some hydrogen-powered semis. You see them at the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach, two of the most pollution-causing sources of, of all sorts of uh, pollution out in the, uh, in the Southern California region. That clearly is gaining traction, and now you have a new manufacturer, Nikola, uh, which has orders and is is I believe starting to deliver a, a small number of their hydrogen semis. I had the chance to ride in. I couldn't drive, but ride in a Nikola just recently, and it was quite impressive. Now, the flip side, passenger cars. Well, we do see Toyota out there with the Mirai, and Hyundai and Honda also have hydrogen vehicles or are planning to bring them out. So there are some people that believe that hydrogen still is a good bet for passenger cars. But where I think you're going to see real traction is on the heavy-duty truck side. Matt? What's the availability like of hydrogen for Excuse passenger cars? Boost, boost your volume. It's a little low. All right. I, th I think I think Matt, you were asking what the availability is. Yeah, uh, the, for, for passenger cars specifically. Thank yeah, you. Toyota has the Mirai up for sale in in uh, parts of California. I think you can get it in San Francisco up to Sacramento as well as all over Southern California. Certainly the Los Angeles area. Uh, you are seeing an expansion in the number of of uh, fueling stations. There, uh, I believe they're approaching a hundred in California. Uh, I have to double check. I know that there was talk about making them available in a few other parts of the country. Uh, I think New York State has a few hydrogen uh, hydrogen stations and the like. But California is the real believer, and that's where you're seeing, uh, seeing the hydrogen stations going in, and you're seeing the manufacturers start up. Now, one of the interesting things is watching what uh, Nikola is planning to do, and I think you're going to see this with some of the other manufacturers. The good thing about trucks, uh, besides the fact that, hyd that hydrogen has some advantages over heavy batteries, uh, the good thing about, about trucking is that your heavy-duty fleets tend to have very designated routes. I know if I'm, uh, you know, if I'm uh, surefire freight that I'm going to I'm going to have deliveries go from point A to point B where I have depots on either end, and then there may be in individual distribution from there, uh, or I may be supplying regularly one of my one of my customers, uh, maybe a, a particular car plant or the like, and by having designated routes that might my trucks generally don't deviate from very much. It also makes it easier for me to set up hydrogen distribution stations along the way. Nikola is talking about setting up some fixed hydrogen stations and some, if you will, portable hydrogen stations where you might have the equivalent of a, of a hydrogen gas truck uh, that parks uh, indefinitely in the lot of, say, a pilot uh, service station one of the one of the big depots along the way where they can fuel up. So there are advantages, and I think it will work in favor of the uh, of the big heavy truck fleets. 
And also the truck stops. Uh, anybody that's traveled across this country on the major highways knows there's truck stops everywhere. Right. And I've heard talk about maybe a lot of these truck stops may then include, along with diesel and, and, and gasoline, hydrogen. I don't know if that's going to happen, but I'm hearing that. So. Yeah, hydrogen and electric. In Europe, uh, in some countries, notably Germany, they actually have new rules going in place uh, that will call for hydrogen and battery distribution facilities along the autobahns and other major routes. Uh, it's it's significant to note that a couple other companies have reportedly signed up with, uh, with Nikola uh, to set up hydrogen distribution along some of the routes for their customers. Uh, I believe we're going to see the same from some of the, some of the other manufacturers. Uh, Toyota and Hyundai have talked about finding ways to set up distribution centers. And and for both hydrogen and and particularly electricity, uh, electric vehicles, we're going to see uh, a number of the big service station, uh, particularly those serving fleets. So, for example, Bucky's recently announced that they're going to be setting up uh, uh, electric. And I, I forgot how many, but it's a sizable number of the, the Bucky's uh, that you see more and more across the country. And for people who don't know Bucky's, uh, it's chain that has, in some cases, as many as a hundred different gas pumps uh, in one location, plus uh, a shopping center, if you will, that's as big as some uh, some malls. Yeah, I've been to a few of them um, in Texas. They're they're really uh, amazing. I mean, it's the biggest one I've ever seen. Yep. One last question that I had. I saw some PR and a little bit of uh, media coverage last week about electric school buses. What do you think the future is for those, for uh, you know, speaking of fleet vehicles? Yeah, very solid. Uh, some states are specifically starting to mandate switches over to uh, electric school buses. Virginia, I believe, was talking about getting, what, 800 or so wow. Uh now, I mean, when you look at the size of the the uh, school bus fleet, that's probably just a marginal number, but it's significant as a starting point. Uh, you're you're seeing a lot of the companies, Bluebird, which is one of the biggest, has uh, started producing, I believe, or if they're about to start producing electric school buses, and I think you're going to see them more and more. Uh, one of the interesting things that I have heard, uh, you may know that. There's a lot of talk about using uh, electric vehicles, not just for transportation, but also as battery backup. And one of the things that some folks have been talking about is the idea that you take your school buses, which very often run on very designated routes and very designated times, and you then can use them as backup batteries plugged right into the grid. So for example, uh, they could be used as energy storage to help offset the possibility of blackouts and brownouts during hours when they're not being used. Such as the summer when the, the grid is uh, stretched to the limit due to air conditioning. Exactly, yeah. exactly. There's a lot of talk about being able to use V2X technology, vehicle to home, vehicle to grid, uh, vehicle to campsite, vehicle to work site, where you can use the battery on board a vehicle, not just to power the vehicle, but to actually provide energy. I, I believe um, is a GM that's running a holiday. Uh, one of the one of the manufacturers running a holiday, maybe Ford, uh, in which they show it. Uh, uh, neighborhood loses its power and it the the home oh, yeah, yeah. I have seen home that, that yeah. has an F-150 Lightning is right. the only place that's keeping its Christmas lights on. Right. right, yeah. Now, I know you've left the Detroit Bureau. Uh, spell out the domain name. I tried looking for it last time around the show. How do you spell the domain name of your new employer? Uh, it is called Headlight.News. Headlight, just like you have on a car, singular. Headlight.News. News. Ah, There's that's no... what it was. I was looking for headlight.com. So nope, no dot com. It's just like you have uh dot org, dot tech, and all the others. Well, it's headlight dot news.